Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lynn Weil, Director of External Affairs for the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, at Georgetown University. Today, we'll discuss Chinese military progress in artificial intelligence and its implications for the United States. And we'll take a deep dive into a recent CSET report. But first, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. If you're on a computer and you're experiencing any technical issues, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and a CSET team member will try to help you out. Please don't use the chat for anything else just yet. And now it's time for our moderator to get things started. Jack Shanahan was a Lieutenant General in the United States Air Force when he retired in 2020 after a 36 year military career. His final assignment was as the inaugural director of the Pentagon's Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, or JAKE. As the first director of the Algorithmic Warfare Cross-Functional Team, known as Project MAVEN, Jack established and led the Defense Department's Pathfinder AI fielding program, charged with bringing AI capabilities to intelligence collection and analysis. Jack served as a special government employee supporting the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence and is currently a graduate student in the Master of International Studies program at North Carolina State University, along with serving on a number of boards and in advisory positions at national security focused organizations. Jack, over to you. Well, Ryan Fadashik is a research analyst at Georgetown Center for Security Emerging Technology, or CSET. His work explores military applications of AI as well as Chinese, China's efforts to acquire foreign technology. Prior to joining CSET, Ryan worked at the Center for Strategic International Studies, the Arms Control Association, the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance, and the Council on Foreign Relations, where he primarily covered aerospace and nuclear issues. His writing has appeared in Foreign Policy, Defense One, and the Jamestown Foundation's China Brief and CFR's Net Politics. Ryan holds a BA in International Studies and a minor in Russian from American University, where he's Phi Beta Kappa, and currently enrolled as an MA candidate in the Security Studies program at Georgetown University, where he also studies Chinese. Ryan, with that as the introduction, I'll turn it over to you and really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Jack. Uh, and thank you all for taking the time to tune into this discussion on China's vision for the future of warfare. Uh, this presentation is mainly gonna highlight findings from my most recent report with Jennifer Malo and Ben Murphy called Harness Lightning, how the Chinese military is adopting artificial intelligence. But before we dive into the specifics, I'd like to take a step back and talk about how we got here and why we're talking about this topic. So in the past almost three years I've been at CSET, concern has really been mounting in Washington about Chinese military modernization and the role of artificial intelligence specifically in that effort. You can see on the right side of the screen that just mentions of the technology in the Pentagon's annual report on the Chinese military have skyrocketed in the past couple of years. We know that leaders in the Chinese People's Liberation Army are bracing for a shift in warfare, and they expect that AI will be the key to unlocking the next generation of that technology. Uh, particularly, they're anticipating that AI will result in a faster tempo of warfare, including compressed decision-making time, uh, and that engagements will increasingly take place between machines, uh, as opposed to between humans with the help of machines. But for all the attention on China's intelligentization strategy, uh, we've seen surprisingly little in the way of public information uh, about how exactly China is adopting this technology and how AI fits into its concepts of operations. Given that challenge, ever since the deep learning revolution in 2014, uh, we decided that we would want to study the role of artificial intelligence in China's modernization strategy. And so my co-authors, Ben Murphy, Jennifer Malo, and I wanted to look specifically at procurement information including how the Chinese military is buying this technology and what commercial applications are already available for Chinese military planners. The bottom line from our report is that we estimate Chinese military spending on AI is probably on par with that of the United States. And that's surprising given the $500 billion difference in the top line budgets of the US and Chinese militaries. 
In particular, we find that the People's Liberation Army is particularly interested in acquiring autonomous vehicles for aerial and underwater reconnaissance and AI-based intelligence analysis and decision support systems. We also find some interesting information about the structure of the Chinese defense industry around AI. Most suppliers of these systems and equipment are private companies. They're not state-owned enterprises or their subsidiaries, like we normally hear about the rest of the Chinese defense industrial base. We also see that the Chinese military is often able to access equipment, data, and capital originating in the United States, in part because of large gaps that remain in the US export control and sanctions regime. Now for the next 20 minutes, I'd like to briefly walk you through the research approach behind our most recent report uh, before I give an overview of Chinese military AI purchasing activity. Then we'll talk a little bit about the structure of China's military AI industry and how specifically the PLA comes to access US origin technology, including through limitations of the US export control system. Finally, I'd like to conclude by opening the discussion about vulnerabilities in China's intelligentization strategy. Now, I think the, most, uh, the, the topic I'm most proud of in our report is actually the research approach, which might be a geeky thing to say, uh, but I think that it's important to arrive at data-driven conclusions when we're talking about technical competition between the United States and China. So like the United States, uh, the Chinese military relies on a fairly convoluted procurement process to actually buy weapons and equipment. It begins when the PLA and leaders within it identify requirements that have to be filled in order to achieve its mission needs. Then the Central Military Commission will field inquiries to industry before finally awarding actual contracts, typically through a competitive bidding process to Chinese companies to actually supply the PLA with weapons and equipment. Now, in the course of our analysis, we were able, with the help of Jennifer Malo, CSET's senior software engineer, to compile almost 66,000 public, or excuse me, uh, mostly public records published directly by the Chinese People's Liberation Army between April and November of 2020. Now, most of this information was either not very interesting or unfortunately had a, a dearth of information we could use in our analysis. Many of these tenders were marked confidential or secret and had limited information to go off of, and others were just announcing changes to uh, actually established procurement uh, documents. So we decided to focus our analysis on the few thousand public documents in the data set. There are about 18,000 records that meet that requirement. And then with the help of Ben Murphy, CSEF's translation lead, we were able to pare down how many of these documents were actually related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, obviously there's some subjectivity here and it's a little bit difficult to tell how many of these documents might just be vaporware, uh, but we were actually able to ascribe a specific use case for most of the documents and uh, projects in the data set. So you're looking here at an overview of Chinese military purchasing activity. And you can see from the graph on the left that the vast majority of contracts in our data set appeared related to intelligent and autonomous vehicles and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance software, as well as predictive maintenance and logistics. Many of these applications appear to be very similar to applications of AI being developed by the US military. Uh, but we also noticed the PLA was investing heavily in simulation and training, command and control systems, and automated target recognition, in addition to information and electronic warfare. Across all of these categories, we noticed heavy investments in undersea warfare and in applications designed to jam, blind, and hack US information systems in a conflict. For example, you're looking now at some of the autonomous vehicles that we know the PLA has come to rely on. In the top left-hand side of the screen is an autonomous undersea vehicle advertised by a contractor in our data set, Tianhe Defense, which was awarded to the Strategic Support Force in October of 2020. On the bottom of the screen, you're seeing several different undersea sensor uh, applications that are advertised by a different contractor, Starsea, uh, that we know has sold autonomous undersea vehicles to the PLA Navy. Uh, and in the top right-hand side of the screen, it's everybody's favorite, the large displacement undersea vehicle first unveiled in 2019 at China's military parade, the HSU-001. But in addition to autonomous platforms, we're also seeing AI being used 
uh, in a disembodied fashion. That is just software available to commanders uh, for applications like intelligence analysis, targeting and decision support. So this uh, image I found particularly interesting. Uh, it's advertised by a PLA contractor as a real-time combat intelligence guidance system. But there's no way of knowing if this is a simulation or an actual screen grab from an operation that maybe they shouldn't be sharing details about. Uh, but either way, you can see that this software is reportedly tracking a US Arleigh Burke class destroyer off the southern coast of California. And it's exactly this kind of system that the PLA hopes will give it an advantage over the United States, uh, potentially in a Taiwan conflict or some other uh, operation in the South China Sea and possibly even further into the Pacific as evidenced by this screen grab. Uh, but in addition to the actual applications being purchased and used by the People's Liberation Army, we learned some interesting information about the structure of China's emerging military AI industry. Uh, most notably that there is a robust and growing AI defense industry in China. And it's primarily comprised not by state-owned enterprises or their subsidiaries, but by private companies that appear to have uh, no level or at least minimal levels of state ownership. It's important to note, however, that ownership information does not tell a complete story about companies in China. For example, most of the PLA's AI suppliers identified in our data set uh, are not state owned, but they do benefit indirectly or directly from equipment, personnel, information, and capital provided by the state. For example, many of the suppliers in our data set were recipients of funding from government-run guidance funds, a topic that my colleague Noor Long has published quite a bit about at CSET. Uh, let me take a second to walk you through a typical Chinese military AI vendor. So we identified 273 unique institutions in the course of our study that were supplying or were selected to supply uh, these kinds of weapons and equipment to the People's Liberation Army or related state-owned defense companies. Most of these institutions were founded by STEM graduates, primarily from elite Chinese universities like Tsinghua and Beida, or by former staff members who used to work at large Chinese or even US internet companies like Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, and Microsoft Research Asia. Like I said, a lot of them have benefited from funding provided by the central government or from local government's military civil fusion guidance funds. Most of them are headquartered in university or communist party run commercialization enclaves or innovation parks. Uh, and many of them also tend to co-publish research with defense affiliated universities and research laboratories. The bottom line is that these emerging companies seem to be fairly small. They've only recently started creeping up in the past five to 10 years. Most of them have fewer than 50 employees and very low amounts of registered capital. And this is in many ways uh, allowing the Chinese military to develop AI in a fairly agile direction and to very rapidly meet operational requirements as the technology emerges. But in the course of our analysis, we were also surprised to learn that many of these suppliers were relying on US origin equipment, data, and capital in the systems they were providing to the People's Liberation Army. For example, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a very clearly labeled Jetson TX2 processor developed by NVIDIA. And this was ultimately used in a natural language processing system sold to the PLA ground force. Likewise, there's a company called Elaine that sells ship tracking data to the PLA Submarine Academy. And that company uses data that ultimately comes from a constellation of satellites run by Orbcom, an American satellite company. Likewise, we even noticed that some US venture capital firms are financing Chinese companies that have gone on to supply the PLA with AI-related weapons and equipment. Some of you might have noticed that today in the Washington Post, there was a story about this topic by Ellen Nakashima and Jian Whalen that mentioned, for example, Eversec and Four Paradigm as recipients of funding from American venture capital firms. Let me give you one last kind of humorous example of the way that the PLA can sometimes acquire American equipment. You're looking right now at uh, what used to be a website. And I would caution you, please do not attempt to visit the URL as it has since been compromised. Uh, but previously, if you were to go to nvidiagpu.com, you would look at a website uh, exactly like this, run by a Chinese company called Linkzol, 
which is an NVIDIA GPU reseller. Uh, and so basically institutions and companies in China looking to use advanced semiconductors designed by NVIDIA can come here to purchase these uh, products off the shelf and then use them for whatever application they may see fit. Uh, and this is actually exactly what happened with the strategic support force in 2020. Uh, according to information in our data set, uh, Linksol sold uh, Tesla NVIDIA uh, or excuse me, NVIDIA's Tesla V100 GPUs to the strategic support force in April of last year. Uh, ultimately, the reason that this is able to happen is in part because there are some significant limitations to the current US approach to export control and sanctions. Of the 273 unique suppliers identified in the course of our study, uh, just 8% of them are named in key U.S. export control and sanctions lists, including the Department of Commerce's entity list, uh, the Chinese military industrial complex list published by the Department of Treasury, uh, and the Section 1260 list uh, required by the National Defense Authorization Act and published by the Department of Defense. And as you've just seen on the previous slide, there are a number of intermediary companies like Linksol that make a business out of circumventing these US restrictions and selling American equipment back to sanctioned PLA units. Ultimately though, despite the significant progress that China has made in advancing its AI capabilities and accessing American equipment, there are serious vulnerabilities in both the technology at hand and China's strategy to wield it for battlefield advantage. First of all, we should note the risks that are endemic to all AI systems. CSET has been leading the charge discussing some of the vulnerabilities that are inherent in machine learning systems in different modes of failure. Uh, for example, along lines of robustness, specification, and assurance. The bottom line is that AI accidents happen pretty often and are bound to continue doing so. Since 2015, for example, the Global Partnership on AI has logged more than 150 AI incidents. We also know that these systems are susceptible to adversarial attacks. In a contested operational environment, for example, uh, they likely would break under pressure and may end up erroneously identifying subjects uh, and maybe even engaging in targets by complete accident. And this is a subject that's been published on by scholars like Michael Horowitz and Paul Schar. And it's something that I think the United States and China are both trying or at least starting to take a little bit seriously. Uh, including within China, there are ethical debates about the use of artificial intelligence, for example. Uh, earlier in the year, uh, some Chinese scholars had written an article disparaging the alleged use of a completely autonomous weapon system in Libya, the Cargo 2. Uh, they said that it was a serious violation of international humanitarian law and that compressing decision-making time as a result of lethal autonomous weapon systems uh, would result in uh, destabilizing the strategic environment with other countries. But there are also debates internationally about this subject. And we know that the United States and China have different approaches to the governance of autonomous weapon systems. In addition to some of the risks endemic in these platforms though, uh, China's intelligentization strategy also faces some serious barriers that I think are worth considering. Uh, the first, which most of you are probably aware of, is China's wholesale dependence on AI chips that are designed by American companies and fabricated in Taiwan and South Korea. CSET has published uh, several volumes of research on this subject, but I was at least surprised to see in our data set records of the PLA itself buying microprocessors designed by NVIDIA and Silex, oftentimes not high silicon and many of the other uh, Chinese companies you hear about being uh, leaders in the space, at least domestically. Something that you hear less about, in addition to semiconductors, however, is the PLA's struggle with data access and management. Like the United States, in most contexts, the PLA struggles with too much data to handle. Uh, there's simply an ocean of information at its fingertips, and it hopes to use AI to better sift through several of the disparate data streams at its disposal. Uh, but in different contexts, there are in fact situations where the PLA appears to lack certain kinds of data required to really operationalize machine learning systems. One example that I've seen PLA researchers and defense industry engineers write about in China is a lack of X-band radar images of targets that can be fed to intelligent missile seekers to automatically uh, identify potential targets for those platforms. 
And so I think that there are certain applications where China's alleged data advantage uh, is simply not true or does not so far extend. Uh, in addition to data management, however, there are also issues with talent and workforce development. Uh, like the United States, it's kind of surprising to see people complain in Chinese that they struggle to get clearances for the right people, especially in public-private partnerships concerning artificial intelligence. In addition, uh, the PLA Officer Corps oftentimes struggles with technical literacy. Many of the members that go through the National University of Defense Technology often end up writing fewer than a thousand lines of code in the time they attend the university. And this is something that the United States is also struggling with. For example, my colleague Diana Gelhaus has written quite a bit about uh, DOD's own talent and workforce development issues with respect to artificial intelligence. The final area where China faces some AI uh, barriers is in corruption and in vaporware. Like in the United States, I highly suspect that there is this pressure to, uh, you might say, sprinkle a little bit of AI onto your project proposal in order to secure funding uh, or in order to win the bid for a given contract. It's really impossible for us to know with certainty how much machine learning is genuinely going on in a lot of the AI contracts analyzed in our study. Uh, but at least by looking at open sources like these, we can surmise uh, some of the applications that are currently available to the People's Liberation Army. As a result of uh, these findings, we've come up with a, a list of recommendations related to sharpening America's war fighting edge and preventing unwanted technology outflow. I think the first and most important recommendation here is that the United States ought to fund additional counter AI and counter autonomy research. Frankly, it seems like both the American and Chinese militaries are constructing enormous glass houses. Uh, and it's really interesting to see how this might pan out in a conflict. Uh, although there are several benefits to be had for the United States in its own development of AI systems, it really seems like AI is the lodestar on which the People's Liberation Army is banking. And they hope that it will confer asymmetric advantages vis-a-vis -vis the United States. I think that breaking those particular systems ought to be a priority for the Department of Defense in its strategy for countering and dealing with the People's Republic of China, in a military context at least. Uh, second, I think that the Department of Defense ought to continue emphasizing rigorous test and evaluation during its own AI development. We know and we've seen the PLA write, talk, and buy AI systems that are designed to break the kinds of sensor and communication networks it believes the United States has come to rely on. Making those resilient and ensuring that there are information assurance capabilities in every system designed and used by the DOD ought to continue being a priority. And policies like the Department of Defense's ethical AI principles uh, and DOD Directive 3009 ought to be viewed as sources of strength, not of weakness, when engaging in technological competition with the Chinese military. On the second side of the coin regarding preventing unwanted technology outflow, I really think that Congress ought to issue a review of the evolving size and structure of the Chinese defense industrial base. It's clear to me that there are several unknown unknowns with respect to the current US approach to export control. There are literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of companies in China licensed to supply the People's Liberation Army with weapons and equipment and it sure seems like the US government struggles to understand exactly who they are and to regulate the kind of uh, interactions US businesses ought to be having with them. I think one solution to this would be to adopt a more flexible and technology-based approach to export control. For example, the emerging and foundational technologies list required by the Export Control and Reform Act of 2018 has still not been released by the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security. I think identifying those linchpin technologies and taking steps to screen licenses for things like graphics processing units would be a step in the right direction. Finally, I think it's vital that the US government scale up funding for offices tasked with export enforcement. Ultimately, I empathize with the Department of Commerce and the Bureau of Industry and Security, as well as the Department of Treasury and the Office of Foreign Assets Control, because it's really hard to understand who in China is supplying the PLA with weapons, data, and equipment. Uh, and frankly, they don't have enough billets at their disposal. There are not enough people working on the challenge. 
And it does seem in many ways like an intelligence issue rather than one of enforcement. And so I think that one step that might go in a positive direction towards solving this issue would be to establish an open translation and analysis center or to more broadly equip personnel in the departments of treasury and commerce uh, with language capabilities and ensuring they have enough resources at their disposal to take on this really massive uh, mission set and, and threat space. With that, I'm happy to field any questions you all might have about the report or about some of the recommendations I've laid out. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. And if there's anything that I can't cover in the next 40 or so minutes, then I encourage you to give us an email at cset at georgetown.edu. Thank you all very much for your time uh, and thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Ryan. And there are bound to be a number of questions and comments on your excellent presentation. Uh, Jack gets to exercise the moderator's prerogative and kick off the Q&A himself. In the meantime, if anyone would like to ask a, ask a question, please type it in the chat and it will be read aloud. Um, we may not get to all the questions, but we'll do our best to cover, cover as much ground as possible. Those who are phoning in for this meeting, please, uh, please understand the limitations and we, uh, we won't be able to answer your questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Um, fantastic presentation. As I, and as I said, before I get to ask the first question, I just wanted to talk about the report itself and commend you and your two co-authors, Jennifer and Ben, for what you've done. If I go back to my earliest days standing up Project Maven all the way till I retired out of the J class summer, we had a hard time getting an, an operational net assessment of what China and Russia were doing in terms of operationalizing AI in the military. There's very good source reporting on sort of open source commercial academia. We struggled a little bit with the Intel community to get good reporting on what are they doing with these technologies. It got a lot better over the past couple of years, but it's still not there. Why? Because one, this is not to denigrate the IC. They didn't know what to collect against until they started talking to the people that were looking at the same things on the US side. So data, compute, technologies, and, and all that. It's come a long way, but there's just too much work to go around. So the importance of what's happening in the think tanks, and, I, and I'll, I'll say, you know, Sam Bendit and, and CNAS on the Russia side, but what CSET is doing on the China side is spectacular. And what you've been doing and, and your cohort have been doing has really contributed to an understanding of, of the operationalization. We have a long way to go, but this is the sort of work that adds to the IC body of work. I hope, and I, I, I'm almost certain that the IC is never gonna view this as a threat to their work. They should be very thankful that it's complementary to them. And the idea of the IC and open source working together and you getting access to things maybe they just can't see day in and day out is so important. So you have done yeoman's work with, with I, I don't think people appreciate how much work goes into looking at those contracts and probably a lot of arcane and esoteric terms used in contract language and, and so on. So this is a seminal uh, document is the way I look at it. And I think it's one of many more to come that really gives us a better understanding, a net assessment of the United States versus China or the United States versus Russia on the operationalization of AI. So I do get to ask the first question and you touched on this, Ryan, and of course you, you do a little bit more in the report. But you know, those of us who've been working this technology for a while understand the technology is one thing, but the real innovation comes from how you put this technology together with legacy systems into new operating concepts. And that happens at the tactical level, maybe at the operational level, certainly not at the big back uh, headquarters level. So what inferences can, can did you glean that you can share with the audience here in terms of what about that operating concept? What are they focusing on and operationalizing AI for military purposes? And I'd say equally important, you know, of course there are some limitations. You couldn't get everything, the classified pieces of it. So where else should the Intel community and open source be focused, think tanks be focused to help close some of those gaps? So we'll start from there and then we'll pick up the rest of the questions. I see they're coming in pretty fast and furious now. So thanks Ryan, over to you. Yeah, well, thank you first of all for the, for the praise um, and for the, multifaceted question. So on, on the first portion about the operationalization within the Chinese military, it really seems like there are two areas of focus that um, cross cut the applications we've laid out in the report. The first is the PLA's focus in undersea warfare. Uh, we know that the Chinese military knows that it's had some significant disadvantages in undersea sensing and detection. 
Uh, whereas above the waves, right, they've got these really sophisticated and exquisite uh, anti-access area denial systems that might be able to strike at US surface ships. Uh, the same is not true below the waves where the United States has really been able to corner uh, Chinese undersea forces in, in certain sub bastions and, and track their movements more efficiently. So I think that the PLA has been trying to push back really since um, it first commissioned uh, an undersea sensing network called the Great Underwater Wall in 2017. And it's since been more public about uh, disclosing some of the many autonomous undersea vehicles under development at different Chinese research institutions. But even before then, uh, autonomous undersea vehicle research and uh, unmanned undersea vehicle research has been a, a longstanding trend in military modernization in China. The second area uh, within the, the first part of your question is in um, information and electronic warfare. Uh, I think that real EW operators are, are aware of the use of AI and cognitive electronic warfare automatically, you know, understanding uh, an incoming signal and then modulating one's own response uh, to try to jam uh, some adversary's platform uh, more efficiently, I think is a real key application of AI that's already underway in both the US and Chinese militaries. But on your second point uh, about the role that the United States can play and, and, and researchers can play in uh, deducing open source information, I think this is really important. I think that um, open source research has come a long way on China. You know, I, as, as a private citizen looking at the low side of things, will never be able to have access to the same kind of um, high fidelity communications and psychological profiles on certain people that are actually making decisions in the Chinese military, but that's also not really necessarily where my interests lie. Uh, and I think that the open source uh, research community uh, has done an exceptional job of exploiting widely available documents. You know, Matt Corda at the Federation of American Scientists and Dex Eveleth at the Middlebury Institute in, in Monterey uh, have been looking at um, geospatial imagery analysis and finding all of these Chinese missile fields. You know, the, the fact that private citizens can go and do this now really is a revolution, not just in intelligence, but in the collection and dissemination of information anywhere in the world. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, great answer. Uh, I think it really revolution is is what's happening. Uh, so I I'm really thank thank you for what you just said. All right. Uh, the questions are coming in. I'm just going to start working my way through them. Jeffrey Riley says or asks, given the fact that all public facing documents from China are approved by the CCP's Ministry of Propaganda, what confidence level do you ascribe to public documents from the PRC? So I'll start, Ryan, because the, there is, a, I think, an analogy here with the U.S. The one place that seems to be unaffected by you know sort of misinformation, disinformation, just like is we do a lot of information operations in the Defense Department. We don't mess with contracting information. Now that might be changing after the release of this report. They might clamp down a little bit. My take on it would be, and I'll be interested to see if you agree, Ryan, that this is pretty uh, publicly facing contract data. Probably take it at face value with a little bit of a grain of salt. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. I, so, so I would agree with your assessment here first. And so we caveat throughout the report, we only know what we can see. You know, we are bounded by the streetlight effects. Uh, thankfully, there are some things we know that we do not know in the data. Uh, you know, there's some very large contracts, maybe the equivalent of like a Jedi-like system or program in the United States that we simply can't see in China. We have no idea who's filling it. We can surmise that some large internet giants are, are involved in its development, but these kinds of records just aren't including that information. And so we make that very clear in the report. Uh, but I also think that the question is, you know, I get this a lot, like how can you trust anything they say in Chinese? But um, there, there are some areas where I think as a result of Xi Jinping's um, allergy to low level corruption, first of all, at the local level, but also just as a result of needing to function as a business where you can't afford to astroturf so efficient, right? So, so uh, when, when the PLA is trying to get the best deal on its weapons and equipment, it needs to solicit bids from companies. It needs to have some indication uh, about what it's interested in buying so it can get these startups to exist and get people to found them in the first place. And so that's exactly what we've been trying to mine, at least with this particular report. But to, to answer the 
question in even greater detail. You know, we take steps in everything we do at CSET to corroborate this information with outside sources. You can look at press releases published by dozens of different companies contemporaneously with when they appear to have received those contracts. You can look at statements and news articles released in very local um, TV and, and news and propaganda stations in China that confirm a lot of uh, what, what's being discussed in these reports, which I would say is a measure of confidence uh, as opposed to an indication that everything is being coordinated miraculously at the very highest echelons of government. Yeah, thank you. This next question from John Nichols is, is one that comes up frequently. It's an important one, and it's one that gets discussed a lot. And his question is, wouldn't you agree that the PLA's use of US chip technology is merely a stopgap? A longtime strategic view would recognize Xi Jinping's initiatives such as Made in China 2025 are designed to develop indigenous chip development. Uh, and this is a big government discussion, and it was when I was, was at the Jake as well. If you press too hard, do you just accelerate China's uh, production? What, what inter, you know, decoupling or interdependence or self-sufficiency, whatever the word of the day is, that's a big one. And, and as a sub-question that, that John Nichols asked is, if China reunif reunifies with Taiwan, with reunifies in quotes, isn't a safe bet that it will gain all their TMS chip fab technology capability. So it's, it's a really good question. I'd like to hear, Ryan, how you address this in terms of, you know, how much do we keep pressing on this and do we just accelerate their own production and is it a stopgap measure? Yeah, so this is a fantastic question. It's one that my colleagues at CSET have written a lot about, especially Safe Khan before he um, left us and, and Will Hunt, um, who's currently taking the charge on this topic. But the, the bottom line, as I see it, is that China has been investing extremely heavily in indigenous chip development for decades. You know, James Andrew Lewis had this great study for CSIS in 2019, um, did, you know, about the, the, the fact that this effort has been dating you know, at well before I was ever born. Uh, but in recent years, we've seen the, the level of funding committed to chip development skyrocket into the tens of billions of dollars annually, at least as far as figures I've seen from uh, industry experts um, who, who do chips, you know, as, as a career. But uh, I, I would question what more the Chinese government could bring to bear in chip development, given how much activity we've seen, uh, you know, to, to try to indigenize. So I, I appreciate and understand that um, the, the focus on chips is a source of strength for the United States. You know, on the one hand, the question is how we uh, ought to, to use this leverage, if at all, if we should hold on to it in the eventuality that there is um, a, a crisis, uh, or, you know, if we ought to use it now to, to try to inflict massive pain on the Chinese chip industry well in advance of a potential conflict. I think this is a, a really interesting question uh, and I don't have a, a solid answer. I think it really depends on your expectations for a, a potential conflict over Taiwan, how certain you are that conflict is to occur, on what timetable you think that conflict would be to occur. Uh, and I think that um, uh, the, the overall trajectory of Chinese chip innovation and development is not something the United States can very easily sway at this point in 2021 going forward. Good, thank you. This next one from Adil Khan is also comes up fairly regularly. And it, his question is, if the proposed suggestions are implemented and as they evolve over time, would these restrictions not have a chilling effect for innovation in the US and for its allies? And this gets to the question, you know, segueing off of his question, is you know how much of AI should remain open source? And this is it, it is where it is today, largely because it's been a, an international open source effort. I think we're at a point now where we're facing a potential adversary where we have to think seriously about putting some some restrictions and clamps down. Uh, so I'd be uh, curious if your answer to Adil's question. Absolutely. I mean, I've written before and, and still firmly believe that international collaboration is the lifeblood of the American and the global science and technology ecosystem. And the United States benefits uniquely from the ability to collaborate with international researchers, including and especially those in China. Uh, for example, China's leader in computer vision and American universities benefit greatly from collaboration uh, with Chinese scientists. But I think that there are very specific applications uh, where my eyebrows were raised, at least, and it seems like there are big blind spots in current U.S. policy when it comes to export control. I think in recent years, there's been 
this expectation that's developed that the United States you know, would want to and is attempting to block a lot of very critical technologies going to the Chinese military specifically. Uh, but frankly, that's just not happening, right? So, so when companies can simply buy access to ship tracking data and sell it to the Naval Submarine Academy in China, that's surprising to me. And it seems like there is some low hanging fruit in terms of policy that the United States can and probably ought to enact in some circumstances, while at the same time preserving overall research collaboration, especially between elite institutions like Tsinghua University in China and, and Harvard in the United States. Good, thanks. I'm gonna to jump to this question because it's, it's a very interesting one uh, from Hannah Case Woods. Um, you mentioned that the small suppliers of these AI technologies had very little capital. Do you think that Chinese hardware is currently able to keep up with this advancing AI software? And the reason I'm really interested in this and your answer, Ryan, because I had a professor at, at Duke uh, that was talking about very familiar, born in China, familiar with technology and what they're doing. And his point was they're advancing very quickly on, on this, some of these aspects of hardware. But the next step is a critical step that he didn't see and nobody was telling him was happening yet was vertical integration with legacy systems. And this is, this is he doesn't know anything about the PLA. He's just talking about in general, the idea of how do you integrate these things between legacy systems and cutting edge? You can only go so far until you truly integrate those vertically. So the question that uh, is asked is, you know, do you think Chinese hardware is currently able to keep up with his advancing AI software? It's, it's a great question that I'm really going to struggle to answer, right? So, so the suppliers we saw in our data set and the contracts being awarded were pretty siloed one way or the other as hardware or software. And there were a lot of companies we saw that specialized in sensors themselves, but not necessarily in data analysis uh, and vice versa. Those that specialized really in software and, and didn't touch hardware with a 10 foot pole. Um, I think that Given that's what we're seeing, there are probably barriers uh, to integrating hardware and software in the Chinese industry like you're talking about. But I also would expect that where we would see that level of integration and convergence between the two uh, would be in the more expensive and likely the more secretive sole source contracts uh, with integrated suppliers developed and provided by state-owned defense enterprises, which we know uh, are less frequent in our data set by design. Thanks. Uh, this next one from Andres de Aragon. Um, hard one to answer, I think, because the level of detail you would have to get into, but it's a good starting point. What do you consider to be the aspects of warfare that could make asymmetric supremacy favor China? This is interesting because it's a reversal of, mm -hmm. um, of the, the typical question asked about how AI would change warfare. So I think that the, the honest answer is that if warfare is large scale and relies relatively little on high technology, then that's actually where the United States is in trouble. We have a much, much uh, uh, smaller surface fleet um, than China does, right? There are a lot of uh, conventional weapons pointed right at Taiwan. Uh, we know that uh, an initial invasion would take place very quickly um, by the People's Liberation Army, and it would be a real challenge trying to take the island back and then hold it uh, against a, a People's Liberation Army that would be bearing down on American forces. And so I think really the, the trip wires that exist in a potential U.S.-China conflict uh, are the ones that have been known to the United States since 1945 the challenge of moving massive amounts of equipment and materiel across oceans, uh, the mastery of supply chains and logistics, moving people in time and, and having enough platforms, uh, attributable platforms ready to go in the event of a crisis. You know, that, re that makes me think of what Colonel Drew Kukor, who just retired after running Project Maven for the entire time since stood up, used to say is, you know who's going to win the next fight? The one who turns around data the fastest and gets new algorithms out to the, to the field. The idea of what does that AI pipeline look like from data ingest to T&E all the way to mm -hmm. sustainment once it fielded. And that's where I think, you know, we're looking for even more insights in the future on, on what, what the PLA is doing in that area. Okay, this next question is from Conrad Stoes. Uh, in the U.S., we have 
have, we also have a number of small companies that serve the U.S. on AI, but almost universally, they struggle to turn small scale experimentation into a scalable business model. Boy, do I know that. Is there evidence in China, in the Chinese contracting data of the PLA picking winners and rapidly helping to scale up some of these young companies that are developing AI solutions for them? This is an excellent question. And so by design, right, the, the structure of the Chinese defense industrial base is one of picking winners by the government and Communist Party. But there is an argument to be made that because this practice is so pervasive uh, and because the strategy of military civil fusion is so ingrained, uh, that winners are picked so often it ends up not necessarily mattering that much and that the overall level of innovation in China is progressing pretty rapidly. Uh, and so I think that's where I come down on the debate, right? The United States clearly has a different system. Uh, it may be inappropriate for the Department of Defense to so uh, deliberately place its thumb on the scale of competition. Uh, and I think that the US system simply isn't structured for that kind of large scale, uh, really deliberate industrial policy, the kind of which we see in China with Made in China 2025 and guidance funds and things of that nature. But I do think that there are lessons the United States can draw in trying to better bridge the valley of death, as you know, General Shanahan, between startups and between you know, commercialized products that are uh, programs of record. That's a, a really long way where a lot of businesses will fail and die along the way. Yeah, and I, uh, the, this question of industrial policy uh, is paramount, and, and I think we've got to address it. Yeah, and as you say, there's only so much we should do to put a thumb on any scale. But the idea of the government making some some, some serious calls about these are the technologies that are important to the future of the United States and the importance of military competition. And then what does that look like in terms of industrial policy? Not to go after and pick specific winners, but uh, we see what the competition is doing. We have, to, we have to decide. And I know there's a lot of people reluctant when they hear the word industrial policy. Uh, we're, we're in a fight on, on this and, and we've got to make some decisions about what we consider. I think we're beginning to see the outlines of that in this, this administration. So it'll be very interested to see where it goes. Okay, next question is from Cindy Martin, Martinez. Are there plans to maintain this inventory of the PLA's AI activities and update it over time? I sure would like to, is the short answer. Um, I'm a firm believer that more people in general should be doing this kind of open source analysis, and particularly that procurement information is incredibly valuable, hard to fake, and really good as an indicator of progress and, and military capability. Um, but the, the short answer, um, Cindy, is that, you know, unfortunately, before we even published the report and several months after we had finished collecting information, uh, we lost access to the original data set that we um, had mined for, for this product. We don't think it's of any fault of our own, uh, but we know some other folks were fairly careless in terms of operational security and, and publishing um, information about the source just kind of on the open Internet. And so I think that at the same time that open source analysts try to leverage these new kinds of data sources, there is a balance that has to be struck uh, to keep um, those sources available for, for future use and to try to treat them with you know, respect and care and, and ensuring that they can be accessed in the long term. Uh, this next question is from Luis Carlo. And I think you, you address this in your recommendations, but give you a chance maybe to, to expound a little bit more upon it. This question is, how can the US government trust or curb Chinese efforts to use American companies to develop their China's own AI systems? Yeah, so I, I think that the second bout of recommendations are, are an adequate starting point, but you know, this is, this is a challenge. You know, the export control system that the United States currently has in place was not designed and is not capable currently of screening every transaction of military relevant equipment being sold to the several thousand potential suppliers uh, of Chinese military weapon systems. And so reconciling that understanding uh, with the current system is going to take massive political will and is going to take serious changes to the way the United States does export control. First of all, I think that we should not kid ourselves and we need broader authority to screen transactions on the basis of uh, technological relevance as opposed to end user. So I wrote an article a few weeks ago in, in Politico describing 
that it's very easy for a, a Chinese company to just change its name if it's placed successfully on the U.S. entity list. You know, I want to commend uh, the folks who do export com compliance because it's a hard job. Mm -hmm. uh, but adding bouts of a few dozen companies at a time is going to take forever. Uh, and, you know, if, if I, I think it was today that the Bureau of Industry and Security added 34 more um, PRC based entities to the entity list. And so if you were to add 34 uh, Chinese based companies to the entity list every month, which does not happen, uh, it happens a lot less frequently than that, then to capture the estimated 25,000 companies that are somewhere in the PLA's weapons and equipment supply chain would take 60 years. Uh, I would be dead by the time that happened. Yeah, I um, understand. Uh, for everybody, we really get some good questions coming in. And I know some of you will, will have to drop off at, at 5 Eastern time. But uh, we've agreed to keep going until I'll take the last question at 510 and we'll be closed out by 515 just because uh, this is great dialogue with Ryan and, and the questions here. So this next one uh, from Avi Lern Lerner, do you think China is taking a dual use, dual use approach to AI? or do its civilian and military interests remain very separate? Um, they are very much taking a dual use approach in the idea of military civil fusion, which a lot of people have written on Elsa Kania, you and CSET. Uh, this, is an important, this is an important one. And I think the idea of AI starting as a dual use technology in the commercial world, then being adapted for defense purposes versus every other technology we've had done, done in the reverse. And it's really hard to decide where one end and the other begins, but give you a chance to, to tackle that question from, from Mr. Learn. Uh, do you think China is taking a dual use approach to AI? Yeah. So uh, once again, I, I, I would agree with your assessment um, that AI as a foundational technology is, is useful in a variety of applications, including military. Uh, but particularly in China, there is this military civil fusion development strategy uh, that I think makes it a, a particularly difficult use case to say that, you know, we're going to cooperate um, with civil institutions to advance AI research uh, and then simply leave military applications alone. That's just a difficult value proposition. Uh, the further and further we go in, in uh, techno-strategic competition with the People's Republic. Thanks. Next question from Brad Godfrey. Is it meaningful to distinguish among Chinese companies when considering export controls? They can be required to front for the PLA. Yeah, so the, the way the current U.S. export control system is structured, uh, has a variety of tiers. First of all, right, we're nominally uh, not permitted to, to sell um, equipment to known end users in China affiliated with the Chinese military at all, uh, any kind of equipment. But then separate from this, there are certain products that are on the Department of Commerce's, for example, commerce control lists that require licenses um, and if a, an entity in China is specifically identified as a potential uh, military end user, then uh, the sale of those particular products has to undergo screening. Um, and so I think that this is essentially how the system works right now. But there are, like I said, some serious issues where individual end users can either change their name uh, or the subsidiaries of a company that's on the entity list are still permitted to buy uh, U.S. origin equipment without having necessarily to undergo license review. So there are just a number of loopholes and workarounds that Chinese companies can use to get their hands on American uh, equipment, data, and capital. And a lot of this is making its way ultimately into the hands of um, the Chinese military. Yeah, and, and I watched how uh, China got pretty savvy about the uh, CFIUS process, uh, got around that. Then FIRMA, they got around that. VCs, they found a way around this. Very, very capable of understanding where those boundaries are and how to skirt around the boundaries. It's very, uh, you see that quite a bit. Um, this next, uh, so one of your recommendations, which I really appreciate, is the idea of investing more in counter autonomy and counter AI. And, and the previous administration got a big start on this uh, in, a, in an effort to do just that. And continuing, in, I'm sure it's continuing in the current administration, we certainly were putting a lot of effort in thinking about this in, in the Jake. And the question comes from Raina DeHenry. Can you give us a little more detail on counter AI? Do you mean countering China's AI capabilities, um, AML attacks? 
or hardening US systems from AI ML attacks? And the sub question to that is, would AI ML attacks be used to slow down Chinese decision making, introduce fog and friction? Well, I, I know the answer to that would be yes and yes. Uh, I, I look at this very similar to electronic warfare. I don't, I don't think it's that different or cyber in, in the terms of the, the sort of the cat and mouse things that will have to happen. We accept that it's here today and your recommendations are important for that very reason. We, we have to keep up with this. But to Raina's question, a little bit more on details on counter AI. Yeah, so I, I think that this is a difficult question to answer as well, because you know, looking just at the unclassified level, um, I'm sure there is a lot happening in China and in the United States with respect to, to countering AI systems. But um, at the public level, we just don't see as much emphasis on countering the technology as we see as we see on developing. And so I think, you know, from where I sit, that is interesting. Uh, and it seems like given the PLA's reliance on this technology to try to leapfrog the capability of the United States, we ought to be focused more on breaking those kinds of systems than even necessarily building them ourselves. And, and maybe you disagree with that characterization, General Shanahan, but I, I think that there is a lot of room to, to, to expand on counter AI and counter autonomy research, specifically you know, generating adversarial examples um, trying to investigate the methods by which the People's Liberation Army is developing its own AI systems, what kind of information assurance capabilities there are. You know, we, we want to ensure that um, for the most part, systems work as intended. We don't want unintended escalation or engagement, and we don't want to, you know, meddle wholesale with uh, PLA data sets such that we would have an unpredictable effect on warfare itself. Uh, but I think that there are opportunities to strategically meddle, as it were, with individual intelligence systems, uh, trying to ensure that you know, the, the product given to a PLA commander is a little bit fuzzy uh, or, or that it's not working to create a common operational picture in their time of need. You know, these are, I think, strategic investments that uh, the United States should be making overall in the technology to have a snowballing tactical effect in the event of a conflict. Uh, yeah, for the most part, Ryan, I, I agree strongly with you. I think we'd be, we would be, I say we, the Department of Defense would be criminally negligent if not assuming that our data was being poisoned, our systems were being attacked by malicious actors. We have to do that. And I, and I would say, uh, with a lot of evidence, we were not reacting soon enough in the cyber world, beginning with the days of the internet, became very, very open, and we've seen all that's happened. But we need to get at this now and under the assumption is if, if it's not really well protected, you might as well give up on it on day one. I'm more interested in our adversaries giving up on it on day one, or as you say, which is a very interesting proposition, give them so little confidence that it's a coin flip, a 50-50. If it's 0%, they just throw it away. If it's 100%, they'll keep using it. If they don't know, ah, now what happens? So it's a really interesting one. I know uh, we won't talk more about it on this one, but the good news is there are people going after that. Uh, good question here from Aaron Manns. When it comes to the flow of USAI technology to China, how much is hardware and how much is software? Are there differences in the patterns or type of products between them? This is an excellent question. I wish I knew the answer to. Um, so to, to give you some context, um, we actually discovered that this was happening. That is, uh, the PLA was indirectly accessing uh, equipment, information, and capital um, from the U.S. kind of circuitously and by accident. Uh, so after finding all of these suppliers identified in contract data, I started manually investigating a lot of these companies and just going on their websites and seeing what kind of products they advertise and you know if they have research partnerships and where their founders came from like microsoft research asia or other companies uh, and in cases like that I, you know we only sometimes surreptitiously found out that you know oh they say right on the website that they get data from orbcon this us satellite company or oh they you know buy this uh, this data from this third party vendor located in the united states or that they they mainly claim to sell um, instrumentation equipment made by other American companies. Like that was very interesting, but you know, my, my cop-out answer is that it's extremely hard to measure this trend at scale because the kind of resources being accessed by companies are different. They access them in different ways. And usually I'm gonna assume that they're not putting it right on their websites, uh, but because they were, we were able to find out about it to begin with, um, which is the, the reason that it's in our report. Yeah, uh, it's uh, important. 
Uh, there's a really good question here and, and one that I think is important to American industry from William Holstein. What do American CEOs who are selling advanced technologies to the PLA say about what they are doing? Do they have full knowledge or can they feign ignorance? So I, I think um, it's difficult to say one way or the other. Um, you know, I, I have less experience personally in, in the setting, but it seems pretty easy to feign ignorance in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, there's more that needs to be done. I think there is an element of naming and shaming here. Not to, uh, I, these com there are companies today that have become so big, they're in almost sovereign in, in their own right, and they have international responsibilities, but there also is responsibility to the national security of the United States, and that has to be addressed. And, and I think a, a few highlights would change some minds if they really knew where some of this money was going. Uh, Richard Uber asked, clearly AI technology is inherently dual, dual use. Can you imagine a regulatory framework that is right size to address truly military grade technology without unduly impacting commerce? I think that's gonna be hard, but I'd like to hear your answer. I, yeah, I would agree with you there, right? That's the, the holy grail of export control. Uh, that would solve all of our problems, right? We could continue collaborating on civilian technologies without having to worry about this kind of thing. But um, unfortunately, another point I'd like to make kind of in this vein is that we often see um, the Chinese military uh, go after intermediary components in supply chains that are not just dual use, but just foundational to a, a whole variety of technologies. Uh, and a lot of technologies of interest to the Chinese government and the Communist Party end up being you know, arguably commercial in nature, like vacuum cleaners and wine extractors. So my colleagues, Emily Weinstein, Anna Puglisi, and I wrote this report earlier in the year on China's foreign technology wish list. And we found that while a lot of the technologies that the Chinese government tends to focus on uh, are clearly uh, with some military application like LIDAR systems or uh, aerial vehicles. Uh, many of them fall in this, you know, too, too low of a category to call a product um, uh, situation where it's just hard to control. Yeah, um, good, thanks. Uh, good question here from Yanadav Shavit. To what extent do these procurement contracts grapple with test evaluation, validation, verification of the system's capabilities the way that the US DOD intends to? And as you're formulating a response there, Ryan, this is an area I'm, I'm involved in, in a, in a couple of different track two dialogues. There, uh, there is an interest everywhere, I think, in really addressing TEV and V for AI, which is different enough. A lot of similarities, right? But uh, there is different enough that we ought to be thinking really hard about what systems are being fielded under what TEV and A? So, in answering that question, did you see anything about test and evaluation in your in the contract information that that you were able to go through? So, <laughs> we saw very little. Um, and on the one hand, maybe you wouldn't expect to see TEV and V being discussed in you know uh, contracts to procure like initial operational capacity and and just new platforms and experimentation for something as new as AI. But on the other hand, this is exactly part of the reason why I so strongly suggest investing more in counter AI and counter autonomy research. I have not seen PLA officers discuss in detail um, any plan to assure the robustness or information assurance of AI systems they are developing and nominally fielding. Uh, China does have some new generation AI governance principles on the development of responsible AI, and they do emphasize safety and controllability, which I think personally is a good thing, because like I was saying earlier, we want to be able to expect the outcome of the use of an autonomous system, and we want to avoid unintended engagements uh, wherever possible. Uh, but I do think that at least on the low side of things, you know, we, we don't see a lot of evidence of TEV and V being prioritized in the Chinese military. Good, thanks. And that's, I'd really be interested because like you, I mean, there, there, is, there is a rationale that you could make or an argument you could make under the rationale that we want our adversary systems to not work as well as ours. 
I don't think that holds water when you're talking systems that that at some point could be autonomous and could kill a lot of innocent people, civilians, non-combatants, whatever. It's in uh, the world's best interest to do T and T E V and V pretty rigorously. So uh, yeah. uh, there's more work on that one. Um, from Frank, Frank, I think we'll get time for two questions and then we'll we'll wrap up. Frank Fan. Um, how do you see the Chinese government oriented thousand talents program, which has sort of gone quiet for a while and his, his sub question to that is innovative ideas and cutting edge technologies are legitimately delivered to China through US universities and could such harmful quote win win and quote collaborations be stopped by research universities institutions in the US. Every event on China a thousand talents comes up. Yeah. Um, and I'm not I, I, didn't, I didn't want to go without it. So no, I had no. to I, I'm not complaining. So I, I, I had the chance to write a paper on this with um, Jacob Feldgois, who is now at the Carnegie Endowment last year. Uh, and we actually identified several thousand people who had been offered Thousand Talents Awards. And we ended up learning a lot of information about the program. So I'm happy to, to answer the question. And the bottom line is that, yeah, there are some real concerns about engagement with certain Chinese universities. Uh, but I think that it is important to disambiguate between individual institutions and even individual departments of concern in China. Uh, we know, for example, there are a group of universities, uh, the Seven Sons of National Defense, which are administered by the Ministry of Information, uh, and, or excuse me, Ministry of Industry and Information Technology in China. Uh, and so uh, we've written, as he said in the past, uh, trying to identify some of these institutions of concern, like the Seven Sons, uh, where U.S. policy should really be focused. Good. Um, I think two more, and they're, I think they're fairly quick. Matt O'Shaughnessy uh, asked a question, and I don't know how much you'll be able to answer. How does China and the U.S.'s thinking differ on the scope and scale of AI's vulnerabilities? This is an interesting question, um, and my answer will be informed mainly by speculation, right? Because there's just not all that much information, um, and it's hard to weigh what to pay attention to uh, to answer this question concretely. But um, I think that broadly, uh, there is a sense of optimism in China and in the Chinese military about the efficacy and use of artificial intelligence. And I think that that may lead to uh, an undercounting of real concerns about its development uh, and recognition of different failure modes, which I know are, are, are topics of frequent discussion and publication in the United States. Uh, and so based on what I can see being discussed in open literature, that would be my answer. Okay, and, the, and this last question, which again, you've addressed in the presentation, but see if you have anything else from Emmanuel Saliot. Is there a difference in US and Chinese warfare doctrines in the scale of the use of autonomous and AI enabled autonomous systems? The bottom line is that yes, there are important differences in US and Chinese doctrine, but I, I wanna take this opportunity to emphasize the similarities, which are actually very striking. Like it's kind of crazy when you read articles in PLA Daily and, and in other you know, more scientific research publications in China, and they cite you know, U.S. Air Force generals like David Deptula or like yourself, General Shanahan. They're talking about how we need to you know, speed up the OODA loop, like uh, observe, orient, decide, act. Uh, we need to construct you know, network-centric warfare and cloudify our AI systems and you know, uh, the, the U.S. concept of mosaic warfare comes up very often. It seems in many ways like the PLA is trying to emulate uh, what they view the United States as already having accomplished in building a, a network-centric system of systems. The difference here, uh, arguably, is that they are focused on then degrading and destroying the system built by the United States. Mm. And they have a very holistic view of how to sabotage and paralyze US battle networks. These are the, the specific phrases that are being used in textbooks, for example, at the National University of Defense Technology. Uh, as somebody who isn't actively involved in military planning in the United States, that's kind of scary to me. And I don't know the extent to which the United States um, understands this threat or, or is working behind the scenes to try to counter it. Uh, but that is, I, I would say, the kind of high level difference between the two strategies. 
Yeah, and you're getting at something, Ryan, that, that I, I've thought a lot about in this idea of a security dilemma with AI. We're just sort of in the, we are, the, the danger is a death spiral where we're each assuming the worst of each other and then accelerating without necessary T and EV and being getting, getting these things feel faster. We have to be very careful about that. We, we don't want this to be a missile gap. And, and what I wanted to say, one of the things I forgot to say earlier about your report, it does such a commendable job myth busting. Right? It's very easy to say we've lost the AI race or we're doomed. Um, not at all. And when I read the report, as I told Ryan yesterday, it was like reading a DOD report. <laughs> I mean, you, we're, we're, you experience very similar challenges in trying to do any AI pipeline. We know the Chinese intent. We know the PLA's intent. The question is, how fast can they get there? So we don't, we don't slow down in the United States. But we have to recognize this is hard work. And you've brought out a lot of the challenges, but also the opportunities for the United States to sort of address some of the challenges China is facing. Uh, and I also wanted to say your report is very creative in, in the way you, you've come at this. So I want, I want to say thank you for that. So uh, I know we didn't get to all of the questions. We got to a number of them. I, I don't know what Ryan's position is on um, answering questions that are added after the fact, but I'll leave that between Lynn and, and Ryan uh, to, to figure out. So Ryan, I, what I want to close before turning it back over to Lynn is just say, thank you so much for what this does. We have fantastic discussion. I love the questions. They're all germane. They're all pertinent. There were a few I didn't get to mainly because they would just get into classified and just, you just can't get there from here. Uh, but I thank you, Jennifer and Ben, for everything you've done. And, and if you're willing to take on questions later, do that. So Lynn, I'll turn it back over to you to close this out. And uh, thanks for just a uh, a really tremendous um, presentation by Ryan and, and his answers. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for moderating and for teaching us all a little bit of uh, Chinese this evening. And uh, to Ryan, thank you for uh, presenting your work and for doing the work together with the team. Um, and we really appreciate all of you for joining us uh, and offering your thought-provoking questions. We are sorry we couldn't get to them all, but if you'd like to learn more about CSET, please go to CSET dot georgetown dot edu and sign up for our newsletter and uh, for our research updates. Our next webinar takes place on January 20th when we'll have a conversation with colleagues at Stanford University's Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. The subject will be strengthening the technical foundations of U.S. security and we will send out information soon. In the meantime, please stay safe, have a happy holiday season, and we hope to see you again if only virtually, real soon.